One of the things that really drives me nuts is when people improperly pull into the median. Remember we talked about this a while back and I showed the picture. Like you're supposed to go to the far side of the median when you're pulling and doing that thing and all of that. And I live in Key Largo and we have those things everywhere. And Friday I'm, I'm, I'm coming uh, south to turn into my neighborhood and coming north to turn into the median just like me was one of those beautiful brand new black Corvettes. I mean, it was gorgeous. And he's coming down the turning lane and I'm coming down the turning lane to the median and we're both going to kind of do one of those deals and I'm like, he's going to do it wrong. He's going to do it wrong. I know he's going to do it wrong. I can just, I can see it. Should I do it wrong too? So we both do it wrong and two wrongs in this case, maybe it might make a right and I don't know. And I'm like, no, I told my church I do it the right way. So I'm stand my ground and I went to the far side like this and he stops right in front of me and stops gives me a piece of his mind <laughs> um i was like I, and that's why i just i like didn't look at him because i'm like you're not doing the right thing it's in the rule book man look at it so that's one of the things that drives me crazy okay what what are some things that drive you guys crazy you just give me a raise hand yeah i saw your hand earlier We're just going to pray and close right there because that was good, okay? He said, when somebody gets popular off of my idea. <laughs> Bro, I don't know if you like flowers, but you, you earned one afterwards, okay? <laughs> All right. What else? Somebody, somebody got something else, something that drives you crazy. Dirty dishes, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, we never have them in our house, but I've heard people let them sit around for a while. One, one other, yeah. 10 miles below the speed limit. That's a good one too. All right, so it's a lot of things that drive us crazy, right? I'm gonna give you another one here in just a couple minutes of something that really drives me crazy. But here, here's, I wanna, I wanna do a little exercise. I want everybody to close your eyes for a minute. Don't worry if you feel, you know, a hand and, you know, grabbing for your wallet or your purse. Don't worry about it. It's fine. I'm just kidding. Close your eyes. If I told you to picture Jesus, get a picture and I want you to hold on for a second. I want you to just picture Jesus. What do you think he looks like? What do you think he's doing? Okay, you can open your eyes. Well, of course, it's Easter Sunday, so or Resurrection Sunday, as we like to call it. And you, you may have thought of Jesus hanging on a cross, and he didn't actually hang on the cross on Easter Sunday, but that's kind of the symbol of it. He rose, maybe you, you know, kind of saw him in an empty tomb or something like that. Um, maybe you pictured Jesus and he was like petting sheep. You ever, you ever seen that picture in Jesus? There's nice Jesus, he's petting sheep, or here's one. Did you picture Jesus with blue eyes and like light brown hair? Okay, just I'm not judging, just saying. Um, how about, and, and forgive me for saying this, but how about that one really weird picture that I see all the time? And it comes from somewhere, I don't know. And it's Jesus and he has a heart on his shirt and he's throwing this like peace, sort of peace sign thing and he's pointing to the heart on, your, on his shirt. You, you guys know what that picture is? You can Google it, you'll see it. Like, like if you Google pictures, you'll see that one a lot. Um, was Jesus skinny? Usually when you see a, a picture of Jesus, he's like really skinny, especially if he's on the cross. I mean, his ribs are sticking out. He's like this super little frail Jesus. Um, do you picture like this mild kind of never, you know, get mad at anybody, never hurt a fly Jesus? Is that how you picture him? See, I, I, I started to Google pictures, and I was looking at some, and I was going to get some pictures and put them up on the screen, but as I started thinking about it, I was like, um, I'm pretty sure there's got to be a verse about don't put pictures on the screen on Easter Sunday and make fun of what people think Jesus looks like. There's, there's probably a verse for that. It's probably not a good practice, so we didn't, we didn't do that. But if you look at the pictures, they're just, I don't, I just don't think they're anything really like Jesus was. So the question is, why do people do that? Why do people want to see this weak, timid, kind of frail Jesus? And I think there's a couple reasons for that. I think if you picture Jesus like that, 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 that weak, frail, couldn't hurt a fly Jesus, 
then you, you don't have to live by his straightforward, no-nonsense, super clear, often difficult teaching. I think if we dumb down Jesus, then, then we don't have to see him for what he truly is. And, and, and we get to kind of mold Jesus into what we want and what fits into our lives as opposed to maybe the other way around. And that's why I think a lot of times that people see Jesus inaccurately. Um, so what drives me nuts really is when people underestimate the person and the power of Jesus. When they see him for something I just don't read in scripture is a true accurate depiction of him. And I wonder if, if we've wrongly seen Jesus and if that maybe affects the way that we treat him. It affects the way that we live our lives. It affects the way that we obey what's written in his word. So today we have a key statement. And if there's one thing that I want you to remember, it's this. So if, you, if you're a note taker, I love you, write this down. Our key statement is when you see Jesus for who he really is, you will really do what he says. When you see Jesus for who he really is, like not the pictures that you can Google of Jesus, which I don't know how they got pictures of Jesus, that's kind of weird, but like when you read about him in scripture, when you get that true accurate picture, and when you see him for who he really is, you will really do what he says. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Now, as you're turning there, you, if you're new to Island Community Church, you may be going, oh my goodness, we're going to the book of Revelation on Easter. <sighs> no, don't worry, it's not like that. But I do want to give you, just to start this off right, an accurate picture of Jesus. So as we are hearing all of these truths in his word, and like I said, we have got a lot to cover today, I want you to see what Jesus is is really like. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. This is John, the apostle John, writing this. He's exiled on an island called Patmos. All right, church legend and history kind of says they tried to kill him. He wouldn't die, right? And so they stick him on this island. We don't know if that's really true, but he's there and he, he is, has this vision or is in the presence of Jesus. Watch what he writes, how he describes him. Verse 10, he says, on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. That's how Jesus would often describe himself or call himself. We're going to see that a lot today. Was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His hair on his head was like white, white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Now, just picture this. John is trying to describe something that is basically indescribable. Like he's grasping for words. He's like, like, like his, even his feet, his feet were like, you know, like when you put bronze like in a fire and it starts glowing and like that thing happens. That's what his feet look like. That's exactly how John is describing Jesus here. Verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. That's a good picture of Jesus, isn't it, church? Now, does that sound like a skinny, weak, couldn't hurt a fly Jesus? Not at all. 
That sounds like a king who can conquer. A king that has all authority and all power. That's a risen savior who conquered death, who conquered hell, who conquered sin. And Easter, Easter is all about that power. Easter is about resurrection power. This power that Jesus had that resurrected him from the grave. Now, uh, Pastor Tony actually said this in the sunrise service. How many of you guys were at the sunrise service? Raise your hand. Good amount of you. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, close to 500 people. Couldn't have been a, a better day. There were tarpon tailing out on the flat. It was. But I was paying attention to the sermon. Just saying. But, but Pastor Tony referenced this too. That lots of religious leaders over time have died for their cause. That's not really a big deal. But only one leader died and was resurrected, and that's Jesus. That's, see, that's the thing that separates all other religions from Christianity. Because let's face it, if you have a guy that can predict his death, burial, and resurrection, and then pull it off, I'm with that guy. I'm with the guy that can do that, because nobody else can do that. And now, yes, Jesus was humble and compassionate and forgiving and loving and merciful and full of grace and all of those things. I do not want to downplay those things. I don't want to shy away from that part of Jesus. But I think oftentimes that we maybe concentrate on those things more than we really understand his power and his authority. And like I said, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, is about resurrection power. And that's what I want us to focus on today. Now, another exercise here. Everybody, on the count of three, we're going to take a really deep breath. Ready? One, two, three. <sighs> okay, you can let it out. I was, just, I was thinking about seeing how long we could hold it in, but I wouldn't do that to you. There's one reason why you were able to do that. And that's because of Jesus allowing you to through his power. See, you don't get to take your next breath without the power of Jesus. That's power. Now, let's walk through. Everybody ready? Let's turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. As you're turning there, we're going to, like I said, we're going to highlight his power and his authority and his sovereignty all the way through his three ministry years. And so as you're turning there as well, I want to just again read our key statement. When you see Jesus for who he really is, you will really do what he says. Here we go, Matthew chapter 4. Jesus starts out his ministry with 40 days of fasting. 40 days. Now, Anybody ever fasted for a long period of time? You can raise your, I know we're not really supposed to talk about fasting, but we're in church, it's okay. Anybody fasted for like a really long time? Yeah, it's rough. I, I, I've, I've done some fasting here and there. Like if I go like 40 minutes without eating, it's awful, okay? Can you imagine 40 days without eating? Can you imagine how weak you would be physically mentally, you, your, your mind would be playing tricks on you. Like, you, you would be in a very interesting state, wouldn't you? And here's Jesus, fast for 40 days, and then Satan comes and directly tempts him. Now, listen to his response, where most of us would have just fallen prey to whatever. Okay, here's what Jesus says. Chapter 4, verse 10, he says, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's power. To be in your weakest state that you could possibly be and still keep focus on the most important thing. Worship the Lord God. Serve him only. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. 
Jesus preaches to the crowd and he goes right after the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And we're going to talk a lot about them today. The Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. They were these know-it-all, big shot, holy roller, thought they were doing everything right, but had absolutely zero relationship with God. And in verse 20, this is what Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus implying right here? He's, he, he's saying that even the religious leaders can't good enough their way into heaven. That's a bold statement. But that's my Jesus. Matthew 6 he goes after those counting on their wealth over God. Verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then drop down to verse 33. Hopefully all of us know this verse. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, I'm powerful and good and generous enough that I'm all you're ever really going to need. That's how good I am. That's how powerful I am. That's how much I will supply your need. Just look for me. Chapter 7. He talks about judgment and the wide and narrow gate and false prophets and true and false disciples. Verse 28 and 29, he says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had, what's that word? Authority and not as their teachers of the law. Chapter 8. There, there's this crazy storm on the Sea of Galilee, and, and, and the disciples and Jesus, they're, they're, they're in, the, in the boat, and the disciples, they're, they're freaking out. They think they're going to die. That's how bad. And remember, many of them were fishermen, and they're like, we're going to die, Jesus. Jesus, help us. We're going to die. Where was Jesus? He was in the back of the boat sleeping. That's how worried Jesus was about this. He's taking a nap in the boat. So they wake him up, and they're like, Jesus, Jesus, we're going to die. Verse 26. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Later on in that chapter, they cross through the lake, and we all know this story. They run into two demon-possessed men. And what do the demons say directly to him? Verse 29, it says, What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Now, lots of description about these guys in this chapter, like nobody else would go around them. They were afraid of them. They would break chains if they would try to bind them. They couldn't do it. And they saw Jesus. And they were like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not the time that you're come to throw us into the lake of fire. Like, it's not that time yet, is it, Jesus? What do you want from us? Even the demons trembled at him. Matthew 9, verse 2. It says, some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, the religious leaders in the room, they freak out at this moment because there was one person who could forgive sin. Who was that? God. So if anybody ever tries to tell you Jesus didn't claim to be God, here is yet again another evidence right here. Jesus is claiming to be God. So the religious leaders are freaking out. So what does Jesus do? He's like, okay, I get it. It's easy for me to say something, but I'm going to prove to you that I have authority. Verse 6. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat and go home. Then the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they praised God who had given such authority to man. Chapter 10. Jesus says some pretty harsh words in this chapter. This is a really, really big chapter. Verse 28, he says this. He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, 
be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's Jesus saying? He's like, listen, don't be afraid of people that can just kill you because guess what? They're just going to kill you. Big deal. Everybody dies anyway. No big deal. If you want to be afraid of somebody, be afraid, be reverent of the person who can kill both body and send your soul to hell. Revere him. Fear him. Now, I know, I know, I know. We often want to hear about nice Jesus, right? Nice Jesus, and he's, he's petting sheep, and he's just, you know, we can kind of mold him into what we want to do, especially on Easter. But again, as we look through scripture, yes, he was full of compassion. Yes, he was full of forgiveness and grace. But what's the one verse say? Full of grace and truth. Jesus was very, very clear about his message, and I think oftentimes we don't accurately look at Jesus and look at his power. Any day I'd rather have clear Jesus than unclear Jesus. Matthew 11, in verses 20 through 24, Jesus is condemning towns that denied his power and his authority. He says, in verse 23, he says, and you, Capernaum, which by the way, Capernaum was his hometown during his ministry years. So he's like talking smack about his hometown. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Whew. That's clear Jesus, isn't it? Chapter 12, the Pharisees, here, here's the Pharisees again, they're freaking out at the disciples for picking grain to eat on the Sabbath, right? <gasps> they're breaking one of the big ten, right? It's number four, don't break the Sabbath. You weren't allowed to, to go out and harvest. All they were doing was they were picking a little bit of grain to eat, and the Pharisees freak out at them. Verse 8, it says, for the Son of Man is Lord of of the Sabbath. What does that mean exactly? Jesus says, um, guys, I made the Sabbath. And by the way, I made the Sabbath for you, for men, not men for the Sabbath. He's like, I, I purposely gave you this day off during the week so that you could rest and so that you would learn to just trust me that I will provide all of your needs. That's what Jesus was saying there. Chapter 13, verse 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 49. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is saying, unless you're covered by my righteousness, you're going to be pulled out like a weed and thrown into the fire. Chapter 14. You guys want an easy one? You ready for an easy one yet? Here we go. I'll give you an easy one. Verse 25. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. He didn't swim. He didn't call them back over. He just simply walked across the water to get to them. Pretty awesome. Chapter 15. All right, breaks over. Jesus reams out the Pharisees again, right? And this time they're complaining that the disciples didn't wash their hands before eating. If that's the case, I'm doomed, okay? Just saying, all right? So, so they're like, really going after the disciples, and Jesus, out of nowhere, he goes, oh yeah, well, you don't honor your father and mother. It's like, what? Uh, like, is this like third grade insulting time? What in the world is going on? But see, Jesus knew exactly what their problem was. He, he goes into this big explanation of this, right? And he just like completely insults the Pharisees. Verse 12, 
So the disciples come to Jesus after this whole interaction. And the disciples, I love this, the disciples are going to help out Jesus, right? Because we know Jesus needs a lot of help in the communicating area, right? Verse 12, then the disciples came to him and asked, ready? Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Jesus, you offended the Pharisees. Do we think that Jesus didn't know that? Do we think that Jesus wasn't trying to make a pretty clear point? Verse 13, he replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Like, Jesus, you can't offend the Pharisees. They'll throw you out of the synagogue, which was pretty much a hell sentence at that point. You can't offend them, Jesus. I'm pretty sure Jesus wasn't afraid of offending anybody with truth. Why do you think they nailed him to a cross? Because he was afraid to offend people? Because he was afraid to speak truth? Because he was timid and compassionate and acceptant and tolerant of their sin? No, not at all. Chapter 16, starting in verse 15, it says, But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Now, I love this interaction. This, they're, they're in the north of Israel at this place called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. There's this spring. It comes right up out of the ground, and there's this huge pond that's there. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. Except for right behind this area, there's a cliff. And back then in Jesus' time and and throughout a lot of history, they would do human sacrifices there. And they would do things that you can't really talk about in church. That's how wicked of a place that this is. As beautiful as it was, it was absolutely wicked place. And that's the place where Jesus chooses to ask his disciples... Hey, I know there's a, a lot going on being said about me. Who, who are people saying that I am? And they're like, oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say, you know, you're this guy come back. You're one of the prophets. Well, then he says, well, who do you guys say I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, or some translations say the Christ, which just means Messiah. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It just means Messiah. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Now watch this. Uh, Jesus does this really cool play on words here. He calls him, he changes his name to Peter, which means pebble or little rock or small stone. Right? So, so he uses, he says, I'm going to change your name to Little Stone. I'm going to call you Peter. And then he says, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not stand against it. Now, a lot of people think, oh, he's building his church on Peter because he called Peter a rock? Incorrect. This rock that he says he was going to build his church on is the foundational truth of what Peter just proclaimed. That Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Do you know why we are right here right now in this moment? Because verse 18 is true. Because what Jesus said there, I will build my church on this foundational truth. And nothing will stand against it. Nothing in all of history has been persecuted as much as the Christian church. And lo and behold, here we are alive and well. Isn't that awesome? Because of this declaration right here. I love last week we sang this song. It says, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the what? The great I am. So good. Chapter 17, verse 1. We got to hurry. I got to talk faster and you guys got to listen faster. Verse 1. After six days, Jesus went, uh, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. 
Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now, Peter, this is just one of the dumb Peter moments here. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Just, if, if that ever happens to you, just zip it. Just don't say anything, okay? But I love verse 5. While he was still speaking, which you could insert the word blabbering in there for speaking. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, when God audibly speaks to you from heaven... And he calls you his son and he tells you that he loves you and that he is very, very pleased with you. You know you have arrived, right? Like if that ever happens, like you know, like that's, that would, that would, we would definitely put that in the W category. And that's exactly how God saw Jesus, his son. Chapter 18, verse 1. It says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Ooh, loaded question here. He called a little child to him and placed a child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, other than God giving you props from heaven, right? Direct audible voice how do you know when you have arrived when somebody can ask you who's the greatest in heaven and you don't say i am or at least i am one of the top three okay god the father god the son god the holy spirit okay you don't say that but what you do is you defer and you pull a little child in and you don't have to brag about your greatness that's also when you know that you have arrived chapter 19 Verse 28, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now, this is some some tough teaching right here. All right, this is really, really getting into it. Jesus is saying, if you're not willing to put me first, you are not fit for my kingdom. Now, that sounds like harsh Jesus. That sounds like Jesus that's, uh, I don't know about that. But often we forget that Jesus knows what's best for us. That Jesus knows when we put anything else in front of him, what is that called? It's an idol. When we put money or our success or our job or whatever, our family, anything, whatever it is, Jesus knows. No, you're going to be distracted. Keep your eyes on me, like he said in chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. All these things, I'm, I'll, I'll, give, I'll take care of all of those things. Keep your eyes focused on me. If you don't put me first, you're not fit for my kingdom. Chapter 20, verse 18. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. And will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Now we're getting into the good part of the story. But uh, when you can effectively speak in the third person like this, you also know you have arrived. Like, I can't pull off speaking in the third person. Look at how Jesus talks about himself. Very few people can get away with that. You've got like Jesus and Dwayne the Rock Johnson, right, can pull off speaking in the third person. But Jesus, he is telling this story of exactly what is getting ready to happen to him. If it were me telling the story about this was going to happen to me, 
I would be freaking out. But not my Jesus. Verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, a weak person doesn't say things like that. That's not how weak people speak. Chapter 21. Now, this was our parallel passage from last week, Mark 11. Starting in verse 12. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Now, Matthew's gospel doesn't say it, but John's gospel says that he actually made a whip to drive them out of the temple. Now, it doesn't say that he hit anybody with the whip. It was probably more to drive the animals out of there. But still, does that sound like a weak Jesus? Not at all. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus says, I am the cornerstone. I am the foundation on which you need to build your life. Don't build your life on sand. Don't build your life on anything else. Build your life upon me. Oh yeah, and by the way, if you don't do that and you try to fall on me, you're going to be broken to pieces. And if I fall on you, you will be crushed. Harsh words. But again, Jesus knows what is best for us. Jesus knows the plan that he has for us. And again, if we put anything else before him, may we make anything else the cornerstone of our lives, our lives will crumble. Chapter 22, verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Verse 5. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then down in verse 14, it says, For many are invited, but few are chosen. Jesus says, The invitation to my kingdom is open. It's an open invitation but very few will choose to come. Chapter 23. Again, Jesus is confronting the scribes and the Pharisees, and he uses this phrase. He says, woe or woe to you. Now, we don't really get it, but back then, it, this would have been such a strong phrase. If, if Jesus or somebody would have said, woe to you, it would have almost has been like pronouncing a curse on someone. That's how strong it would be. So here we go. Verse 15, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He stabs the knife and then turns. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Imagine Jesus telling the most religious people in the world that. Verse 27, he does it again. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. That would have been putrid to them. Absolutely disgusting. And Jesus is saying, that's exactly like you are. You look good on the outside. You got the bells and the whistles and the whole get up and all of that. But inside, you're absolutely disgusting. Chapter 24, Jesus speaks about his return in verse 42. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Verse 44, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Verse 50, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites 
where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says, I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised back to life. I'm going to go back into heaven for a little while. And then I'm going to come back. And you'd better be ready. You better have your affairs in order. There isn't going to be another chance. You're not going to be, oh, now's the time I will make everything right. Jesus says it's not going to work like that. You better be ready. Chapter 25. He continues on this theme of returning. He says, when I return, I'm going to see what you did with what I gave you. With what I gave you, did you use it wisely or did you squander it? And in verses 21 and 23, they're mirror verses. It says, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. So the question is, have you made Jesus Lord and master of your life? Verse 31 says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. Now, some of you may be really cool, probably way cooler than I am. You may be really popular. You may be very successful. But I doubt that any of us ever one day will sit on a glorious throne and, well, according to this verse, pretty much Everyone ever on the face of this earth will sit before him. That's Jesus. That's the power and the authority of Jesus. It's going to be a great day for some. It's going to be an awful day for others. Chapter 26, almost there. Verse 21. And while they were eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. Verse 24, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him. How bad would it be? How bad would it be to betray Jesus? It would be better for him if he had not been born. Pretty bad. Now, Jesus is being arrested in the garden, and remember that whole deal, Peter he, there's Peter again, pulls out his little sword, and he, he, and he cuts the ear off of the, the servant Malchus. Right, and that whole interaction happens. Verse 52 it says, put, put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? And you're like, dude, that's a lot. I don't know how many that is, but that sounds like a lot, right? We don't really know exactly how many Jesus was saying, but according to what legions were back then, this would have been anywhere from 50,000 to around 150,000 angels. Jesus is like, Peter, Peter, put your dinky little sword away. I don't need that. I don't need you to try to save me. Thanks for the effort and all. I'm going to go ahead and put this guy's ear back on. Okay, but don't do that. It's like, like I, I don't need to be saved right now. If I needed to be saved, all I had to do was pull out my phone, call God and say, hey God, can you just dispatch some angels right here? And there'd be like 150,000 angels here. It doesn't read like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay? That's in, that's in, no, I won't even say that. But Jesus is like, listen, I came here for a purpose. Now, in case you're wondering how much damage could 150,000 angels do? There's this really cool story. Don't turn there now. We definitely don't have time. But it's in 2 Kings chapter 19. And the Assyrian army is surrounding Israel and Jerusalem. And one, one angel comes and it says he kills. You ready for this? 185,000 Assyrians. One angel killed 185,000 Assyrians. Pretty sure 150,000 angels or so could take care of Jesus, right? Verse 67. It says, Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who hit you? The most powerful being ever was allowing the 
this to happen. That's power. Power oftentimes is holding back and not just letting go. Chapter 27, two more. Now here's, here's more of this allowing. Here is our Easter story. Here's more allowing. 29, chapter 27, verse 29. And then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. And he just sat there and he took it for you and he took it for me. Now here's some more power and authority. Verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. This was the moment. What happened? Nothing. People went back to their regular lives. Was no big deal? No, verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split and the tombs were broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. I don't know. I don't know. It says it. Verse 54. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Pretty sure none of that stuff is going to happen when you and I die. But it happened with Jesus. Matthew 28, the last one. You guys ready? Here's the good stuff. Chapter 28, verse 1. It says, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and... Going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Here is one of the best verses in all of scripture. He is not here he has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Man, that's the best part of the story right there, isn't it? That we don't serve a savior who just died. That would be a pretty cruddy story, wouldn't it? We serve a risen savior, amen? Here's a question for you. Could a weak, powerless, never say the hard things, never stand up against sin, never speak out against wrong, cower to the religious authorities, Jesus raise himself from the dead? I don't think so. I don't think he could. But that's not who he was, was it? One more time, our key statement. When you see Jesus for who he really is, you will really do what he says. Hopefully today you have a better picture of who Jesus really is. Hopefully you've seen his person and his power. And yes, again, we love the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness. I do not want to downplay those things. I love the, I am counting on those things. But the moment that we concentrate on those things and we forget about this other half of Jesus is I think the moment that we start losing some of the power that he has. But so there's a, a question here that I've kind of left. I don't know if you've caught it yet, but there's a problem here with my key statement. 
Because it says, when you see Jesus for who he really is, you will really do what he says. And I guess there would be a question of, what does he say? What is it that Jesus says that I should really be doing? Now, I got to tell you, I really struggle with this because there is a lot of things in Scripture that I went through that I could have put. And I landed on this verse, John 3, 36. This is in the ESV. I like how it says it. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. If you believe in Christ, if you put your faith in him, if you put your trust in him, nothing else, nothing else. He is the cornerstone of your life. Nothing comes before him. There are no idols. It is just Jesus. Not your good works, not your grandmama's faith, not your church attendance, not how much you give. Nothing but Jesus. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now watch what happens here. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, something interesting happened in this verse. Did you see the transition? It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And, well, if I was writing this, I would have put, whoever does not believe in the Son shall not see life. But it doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? Whoever does not, what's that word? Oh, that stinking word. We don't like that word oftentimes, do we? Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see it. Now, Okay, there it is. See, Jesus is just about a bunch of rules and the Ten Commandments and all that other stuff. And no, 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 no. What is, what is obedience? Jesus kind of wrapped it up into two really simple things. This one guy comes up to him and he says, hey, what's the, what's the greatest, you know, commandment? Which, which one's the, the most important one? Jesus says, oh, that's easy. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But Jesus doesn't stop there, and Jesus always does this. He's really good at this. He's like, oh, and the second one, he's like, I'll give you a bonus, okay? The second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says something that would have just, whoa, he said, all the other commandments hang on these two things. So I'm going to sum it up. Love God, put him first, and love people. If we want to obey God, we want to we do what it says in his word. We love him. We put him first. We love people. And he's like, everything else kind of falls into place. Don't look at me like I'm a bunch of rules and I'm a killjoy and I'm just like this policeman with a big stick ready to whack you every time you do bad. Don't, don't, don't look at me like that. Love me. Put me first. And when we do that, when we finally get that, we're like, oh, oh, okay, God. I see how you're trying to guide my life and direct my life and work my life. I see, God, how you want the best for me, that when I stray from what you have for me, that's when things go real south real fast. So to obey God means to follow him, to trust him with your life, to put him as first in front of everything. And I think if you truly believe in Jesus, you will fully obey him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you stood there. And you took the mocking, and you took the shame, and you took the beating, and pain, and suffering, the spit in your face, repeatedly being punched, whipped, torn to shreds, unrecognizable. And you stood there and took it from me. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for seeing me, seeing us in our sin and knowing that our sin cannot enter into eternity with you. And in knowing that, provided a way for us to spend eternity with you by sending the most beautiful, most important thing that you had, your son Jesus. Thank you, God, for that perfect sacrifice. And God, if there are people here this morning or attending online who do not know you as their personal 
Lord and Savior, who have not made you the cornerstone of their life. God, right now in this moment, would they just cry out to you? If that's you this morning, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. Just cry out to God. Just say, God, I need you. God, I I've trusted in other things. But now I understand it is only through your son, Jesus, and full faith and trust in him that I can spend eternity with you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to celebrate with you. I'm not going to call you out or cause any commotion, but I would just love to pray with you. Would you just slip your hand up? Let me know I got that right today for the first time. Like I started a relationship with Jesus. Again, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. You are so good. Thank you that we don't celebrate a dead Savior, but we celebrate a risen Savior. God, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to realize the power that it took to be raised from the dead. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy you continuously pour out on us. God, we lift up this time of offering. Use it. Bless it. Help us to be generous, God, that we can bless others and that we can do things as a church that are going to matter in 10,000 years. Jesus, we love you. We praise you. And it is in your awesome, most holy name. Amen. Amen.